Yes, so thank you uh, for the introduction. Um, and I'm very happy to be here uh, for the webinar. Um, and as you mentioned, I'm in chemical engineering and materials and aeronautics uh, department. So ICT and artificial intelligence, uh, these are things that I am trying to understand and bring into my research and other activities. So this is, I'm really from a non-ICT uh, background. So my background is in chemical engineering and and which and I apply those uh, principles for uh, water treatment, water engineering, and bioengineering mainly, uh, spanning into two areas. And now, how I combine uh, these two areas is I apply principles of porous materials because, as you'd appreciate, porous materials are everywhere. Our uh, skin could be treated as a porous material. Uh, bone are are porous materials. So there are a lot of porous media uh, applications uh, in bioengineering. And in the same way, if you look at non-biological areas such as water treatment uh, or even energy uh, technologies, uh, we have a lot of porous media uh, applications. So today, I'm just going to give some examples and uh, from non-biological uh, engineering uh, perspective, and I'll try and discuss where is the scope for artificial intelligence. This is not a question that I'm trying to pose to you. This is a question that I am constantly asking. And although I know that there are a lot of scope for application of uh, artificial intelligence uh, or machine learning uh, uh, in slightly broader sense, uh, but this is something that I'm trying to develop myself. So I'm sort of someone from the application point of view. And I listened to the talk, so it was it was interesting, and I learned a few things as well. So I don't have a content slide, but I just wanted to recap that if you look at uh, sort of infrastructure point of view, uh, these are things that we have grown up uh, seeing. Uh, I come from India, from northeast of India, where we have hand pumps, and wherever you come from, whichever part of the world you come from, uh, we have seen hand pumps of some form. So these are the collection of some hand pumps that we use uh, in different parts of the world, uh, basically trying to extract water uh, for our drinking purposes. Of course, as the water comes out, it comes through the soil, which is a porous media. And this porous media act as sort of filtration system as well. So porous media has a lot of application. But if you, and these are, uh, pictures that I have taken from one of our published books. So these porous media could be everywhere. So and water infrastructure as, as a principle or as a concept has been applied in various cases. So what I want to do today is uh, take you through uh, three cases where uh, we apply porous media principles and perhaps we can see how we can apply uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence uh, principle for uh, design uh, operation as well as control, as well as regular monitoring of these systems uh, could be done. So here is a simple concept. Uh, this is not a new concept. Uh, it's called a permeable reactive barrier. Uh, but uh, basically what it does is these are uh, reactor system, uh, reaction engineer and bigger reactor that we can design and insert in the subsurface. And as contaminated groundwater goes through, uh, it does reactions within the reactor, uh, typically oxidation reactions. So oxidation means you exchange electrons and protons uh, within the reactor, and there are different um, materials within that typically various catalysts, uh, it could be zero valent iron, uh, and so on and so forth. So these reactors needs to be operated, they need to be designed, they need to be operated externally from outside the subsurface, so you could be on the ground level, while the reactor is within the subsurface. So operating them, monitoring them uh, is key uh, in uh, successful implementation of projects like this. So lifetime of these projects would be typically 30 years, 25 to 30 years. 
And so you can see how long a project could last. So there's a monitoring goal for 25 to 30 years, but uh, PRB often fails because there are certain mechanisms that we don't understand or we cannot uh, monitor them uh, as well as we should do. So one of the key reasons why this PRB fail is because the permeability within this uh, PRB declined so fast that water flow does not go through. So we do various modeling and experiments to understand how does the uh, permeability declines. So we want to bring out the mechanistic side of it, the physical chemical relationships and the processes that would take place and that affect the permeability decline. The idea is that if we understand this relationship, we can then design uh, these processes better. But as you'd appreciate, monitoring could be done. Uh, we have sensors and various gauges and valves, but monitoring of this, you know, how artificial intelligence could help them uh, is the question that I'm trying to pose here. So if you look at a typical lab setup, this is what happens. Uh, you have some contaminated groundwater that flows through a lab scale, large scale, uh, or we can have different scale of reactors in the lab and we have got treated water there and we can pick up number of points within the reactor uh, and we can look at how does the flow pattern uh, takes place. If it's functioning normally, we would see that the flow through the reactor uh, is fairly constant provided nothing else is changed. But as you would see here on the graph bef uh, below declining flow patterns, this flow starts to go down. Uh, and this is despite the fact that we have pressure gradient. So we keep the same pressure difference across the uh, reactor and the flow starts to go down. And pressure obviously is related to energy. So you could increase the flow by putting more pressure, but that means your energy cost becomes much higher and it doesn't become a cost-effective method of water treatment. And so this is what you see on the graph on this side, where from purely from the physical point of view, we can see that the permeability uh, within the domain uh, at different regions, uh, at different points within the reactor uh, starts to go down. So one of the key part uh, is to try and understand the relationship between this permeability decline within this reactor. Uh, of course, we have data at the lab scale, but the idea is that if we can understand this well enough at the lab scale, uh, we can take this uh, results and translate that into a bigger scale as well. So from a purely machine learning point of view or artificial intelligence point of view, if you start thinking of a structure, uh, NN structure, uh, so you can, as you can see here, uh, you can have uh, either a single layer, a hidden layer structure or a double hidden layer, two hidden structures you, you can have. You can have number of input parameters. So these are the parameters that would typically uh, affect the permeability and we would identify this uh, from our experiments and as an output, we have this permeability. So this is sort of a lumped parameter, the overall effect of number of parameters on the performance of the reactor. Uh, and you would then begin to see how do this affect uh, the permeability. So there is a huge scope of uh, applying uh, machine learning for uh, water infrastructure like this. And you can see the difficulty there, the number of uh, degrees of freedom there. Subsurface are different, there are different heterogeneity patterns, the flow variables are different, media works differently. So there's a huge scope there. So we are trying to develop this uh, concept a little bit more, but obviously I'm not from an artificial intelligence background. Uh, so I'm looking for collaboration uh, as well. Uh, so as you can see here, you have got number of parameters, time, pressure drop, porosity is important the flow rate, the, the, the length of the reactor, that's how big the reactors are important, the particle size of the materials we put in. So this is a porous bed and what effect does it have and the fluid properties, uh, so and so forth. So the other case that I want to look at uh, relates to uh, climate change uh, 
and 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 something related to co2 uh, sequestration so as you would know because of climate change uh, because of co2 uh, release in the atmosphere uh, a lot of people are trying to store co2 under the surface in 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 oil uh, field and there are also other uh, uh, geological uh, formations uh, sand, silica sand, uh, and there are different types of materials where we can store this CO2. So the storage of CO2, which has been extracted or separated uh, from a place, could be done purely on the basis of chemical reactions, so chemical storage, uh, as well as a physical treatment, physical uh, uh, entrapment of this uh, CO2. So there's a lot of chemical engineering uh, principles there. I don't want to go into all this. You know, these are two phase phenomena, uh, then CO2 dissolution. You have, uh, for example, uh, Pepsi and Coke, you know, how you can store CO2 under pressurized conditions. Uh, phase uh, behavior of CO2, because CO2 is very interesting as a, as a chemical. It has got four different phases. Uh, gas, liquid, supercritical, and also solid uh, CO2. So CO2 is very interesting uh, as a chemical, but how we can store them, how we can monitor them once it's stored are the problems. And, you know, sensors, so we have, we can develop sensors, but how do you understand how the sensors are behaving, the sensor responses, and how you monitor uh, sensor responses with the help of artificial intelligence uh, over a period of time. These are again long-term projects uh, that you have to monitor uh, for a very long time. You know, if you don't know, uh, this is not new. Uh, I'm just showing a schematic um, idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, so you have uh, typically CO2 either in liquid phase or in supercritical phase, you put the CO2, pump CO2 through uh, boreholes, and then you inject it at the bottom of the borehole, as you can see there through a pipe, and CO2 is released, and it starts to get dissolved in the groundwater, uh, initially as a two-phase flow, but it starts to react uh, with the materials. So you have geochemical reactions, and sometimes you have storage, uh, such as two-phase uh, storage in terms of dissolution. So this is what it says there uh, in, in this slide. Uh, there are different mechanisms of CO2 storage, structural trapping, physical uh, trapping because of the structure of the uh, subsurface. We can have solubility trapping, just like Coke and Pepsi. A capillary trapping is in the, inside the small pores in the porous material. And the long term, uh, uh, this is via geochemical reactions. We can have geochemical reactions and have CO2 uh, <clears throat> Uh, trapping as well. And as you'd appreciate, there are different types of porous materials. Uh, basalt uh, is, is there around the world. Uh, India has a lot of basalt rocks. US has a lot of basalt rock as well. So in basalt rock, we can have ge geochemical reactions uh, to have a really long term uh, capture of CO2. Limestones and silica sand, these are much more well known uh, 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 materials or subsurface or geological materials where we can store CO2 as well. So we typically we would try and do these experiments and develop sensors to understand how these materials are behaving, uh, how much uh, storage it has. But as you'd appreciate, it is not easy because CO2 and, uh, and water, there are two different phases. So our experimental principle, it's based on a measuring electrical behavior of the material. So we have demonstrated, as well as other people have demonstrated, that the electrical behavior, uh, bulk permittivity, and basically the dielectric properties of the material, it changes depending on what is captured there. So if you have water and some particles, you would get a different electrical behavior uh, then if you have carbon dioxide and the material. So the sensors that I'm talking about, you can see some of these uh, pictures there. So the sensor basically measures the electrical responses or the dielectric properties 
and we can then uh, convert them into numbers, into uh, properties that we can measure. So that's what you see here. Uh, we can measure bulk electrical conductivity and bulk dielectric permittivity. So we have to measure them simultaneously and we can do all kinds of measurements really. Uh, so this is in the case of different uh, pH, uh, different uh, pressure, uh, different same temperature with different salinity. I can see so the salt is different. Uh, so the salinity is different. And because of that, you get a different pH value as well. But the idea really here is to understand how this material behave uh, under different conditions so that we can backtrack and understand in case we are monitoring them, we know how much CO2 is there in terms of monitoring, but also from regulatory purpose, for example, leakage and things like that. So this is sort of sensors, different way. This is a cross-sectional point, cross-sectional view of the sensors. So we look at both the point measurements, the electrical uh, properties, as I was mentioned, but we can also look at sensing the flux of it, how much CO2 has gone through a small cross section of the sensor there. So here we have got a membrane that behaves as a dielectric uh, material, not dielectric, as a diaphragm. And we know the cross sectional area and we can understand the amount of CO2 that goes across the sensor tip. So we look at the, both the point measurement and the small cross sectional measurements. So from the sensor point of view, we know but we need to be able to monitor them uh, over a period of time. And that's where the artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning techniques can come into. So this is again, as I was saying, not my area, but that's something we are interested in developing. So we are looking for collaborations. We can do modeling as well, because these are long-term projects. So you need to know how long these uh, CO2 are stored in the subsurface. So as you can see here, a geological time frame are really long so we can we can model them computationally from say 30 years to 5000 years uh, so we can generate lots of data but monitoring them over a period of time are key so if you look at a typical nn structure just to give you an idea this is published uh, paper uh, so we have a number of input parameters or variables if you look at uh, water saturation, CO2 saturation, uh, relative permeability of the fluid, uh, then some properties of the material, uh, and also the injection pressure and temperature is very important uh, for the CO2 because CO2 can stay in different phases, as I was saying uh, earlier. You can come up with all different kinds of N and structures, and as it's typically done, we can look at how do this a different uh, NN structure uh, the perform uh, if if the number of hidden layers and 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 so and so forth uh, changes. And you can look at uh, how it responds. So this is what we would like to have at the end. So something that uh, mimics reasonably well. So we can understand how the NN behave, the structures behave, so that if we do translate some of these sensors into real life, we know how to do these sensors. We actually perform under different circumstances. Uh, so we are sort of going through the forward step and in the field when it's unknown to us, we will have the NN as the known, uh, known case and, uh, and the unknown would be the, with the real situation. Other thing, very quickly, I want to go through. I don't know how much time I have got. So the other big interest I have related to porous media is uh, water security and uh, and water treatment, uh, particularly involving uh, porous materials. Sorry, involving porous uh, membranes. Um, and 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 this uh, with porous membrane, various systems have been developed, and they have been upscaled into larger. Uh, scale systems that can deal really large flow of uh, liquids, uh, whether it's uh, salination or reverse osmosis, uh, water treatment, uh, large scale uh, plant and, and units 
have been developed, but how we monitor them, uh, and in particular, the security aspects of these uh, systems are important. Say, for example, water security. So we are interested in uh, looking at water security from the membrane system point of view. So I have got the projects running uh, at the moment uh, from UK EPSRC, uh, looking uh, looking at that aspect, developing a secure uh, water treatment system. Now, the, if you don't know about uh, materials and chemicals, uh, maybe this would be interesting. So in one of the projects, we looked at natural organic matter. So typically humic acid and humic acid tip comes from plant. For example, in autumn, we have got tree leaves falling and these tree leaves rot. And because of the rotting of these tree leaves, it releases this uh, uh, natural organic matter, humic acid, and that changes the pH. So while autumn is very nice to look at, we have this tree falling, it creates a lot of environmental pollution as well. So we looked at this uh, treatment of this natural humic acid uh, from, from the point of view of uh, drinking water supply and, and production using membrane system. Um, and clogging is a big problem, uh, as you would know, fouling of this membrane. So you can see this picture on, on, on there. So you can have a membrane, you have got number of uh, these particles on the left. These are humic acid particles. Uh, this is a micrograph, as you can see there. But in reality, this is what's happening. Uh, it clogs up the membrane. So the smart treatment of these material are important, like lots of other materials as well. Uh, let me skip this slide. Uh, it's not important. Uh, so a lot of our work involves preparation of these membranes as well. So pre membrane preparation is actually still very trial and error method. Uh, so, so the process needs to be digitalized. So digital preparation of membrane could be very interesting for us. You know, some of the presentation that showed uh, autonomy uh, and bringing in some digital uh, techniques to prepare this membrane that can control the performance, control the properties of this membrane would be really interesting uh, for us. But at the moment, we are looking at uh, process, as process engineers, as chemical engineers, we look at processes, monitoring and control of this uh, system. So this is something that we are running at the moment. I don't want to show much result, except that the point we have, uh, we are looking at the cybersecurity uh, point. So CPS uh, point of view, how we can make sure that these uh, treatment systems are secured uh, for water security. Uh, so this is my colleague, a technician, a technical colleague. So he is looking at uh, developing some sensors uh, for our rig at the moment. And once they are done, we'll try and uh, build in some cybersecurity kind of concept using sensors and artificial intelligence. So I hope I've given you a little bit of flavor uh, of where porous media principles could be applied and where artificial intelligence and machine learning concepts uh, could be applied. Um, and, uh, and I'm very happy to take any questions or comments. And also later on, uh, if you would like to interact in any possible way, uh, my email address is there. Uh, please drop me an email and hopefully we can set up some discussions. But thank you for, for your time and your attention uh, for the time being.